Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. So as Mayor of Glastonbury, I would like to welcome you all on this prestigious occasion when we will bestow for the very first time the liberty of the key of Avalon on a trusted friend of Glastonbury. However, before we do so, in our time-honored tradition, established by Wellesley Tudor Pole with King George VI and Sir Winston Churchill, I would like to invite our honored guest, Mr. Prem Rawat, to light the Glastonbury Unity Candle and then for us to stand together to observe the silent minute focusing on peace. So Prem, would you be happy to light this candle for us? Ladies and gentlemen, will you stand and with me observe the silent minute, Pax Cultura, Pax Mundi. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Please do take your seats. So now I would like to invite Jenny Bliss and William Kramer to play some music for us for a few minutes. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So today's civic ceremony to honor Prem Rawat reflects something of the special nature of this place, Glastonbury. Glastonbury is, of course, for many people in the UK and around the world, famous for its music festival, Glastonbury Festival. But there is so much more to Glastonbury than just the festival. We are an ancient spiritual center, the Isle of Avalon, home to what many believe is the first Christian church in the world founded by St. Joseph of Arimathea, the man who gave up his tomb for Jesus Christ. Joseph is said to have traveled to Glastonbury in AD 37 with his 12 companions, bringing with him the Holy Grail, the cup used in the Last Supper. Arriving on this sacred isle, Joseph places his staff on the ground, weary all, and it miraculously bursts into life a living tree we know as the Holy Thorn, the Holy Thorn of Glastonbury. And above him, at that moment, appeared the angel Gabriel, who said, go down into the valley, and there you will find a church prepared by God. And they did find this interesting little building made of wattle and daub that was told to be dedicated by Jesus to his mother, Mary. A story reflected in the words of William Blake, immortalized in the hymn, Jerusalem, and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green. Upon Joseph's arrival, we are told that the British king, Avaragus, granted Joseph the 12 hides of Glastonbury, which encompasses the whole of the island making the land here independent of state and monarchy. A grant reaffirmed by many subsequent monarchs, and uh, it gives a unique relationship between this place and the queens and kings of the day. Indeed, sprigs cut from the descendant of Joseph's staff, the Holy Thorn, which flowers twice at Christmas and at Easter, are sent by Glastonbury each year at Christmas time to the British monarch, a reminder of our ancient founding and our unique heritage. Her Majesty the Queen has received a cutting every year of her 70 year reign. As the ancient Isle of Avalon, Glastonbury is celebrated too as the last resting place of King Arthur after the tragic battle of Camlan. In medieval times, the humble first church had grown into the largest abbey in England, the holiest earth, a center of pilgrimage known as Roma Secunda, the second Rome. It was so important. Modern day Glastonbury, a cultural and spiritual center of worldwide importance and significance, is a place of pilgrimage, of art and music, distinctly radical and dare I say, magical. And although this town has less than 9,000 residents, Glastonbury is home to 81 different religions, creeds, and faiths. Truly a place of tolerance, of unity through diversity, and of peace. So why are we here today? Well, in 1971, as I'm sure many of you know, a 13-year-old boy on a school holiday from India spoke on the first ever pyramid stage at the Glastonbury Festival. On the bill were such superstars as David Bowie, Fairport Convention, and Hawkwind, amongst others. This young boy's message was a message of peace for all. And this Glastonbury moment began a lifelong journey for him and many others in helping humanity to find peace. In 1972, at 14 years old, as he toured the world, at great personal risk, he became the youngest person ever to be blacklisted and banned by the apartheid regime in South Africa for refusing to hold racially segregated events. 50 years later, Prem Rawat has reached out with a practical message of peace to hundreds of millions of people globally. 
He has spoken at the UN, the EU, the UK, New Zealand, and Australian parliaments, the Guildhall and Kensington Palace, to name but a few. He has conducted over 5,500 speaking engagements in over 450 cities across more than 75 countries. Often those speaking engagements exceed 400,000 people with live broadcasts of 70 million. Prem has worked with the poorest and the most deprived communities, with combatants in war-torn countries, including Colombia, Sri Lanka, East Timor and the Ivory Coast, and in townships in South Africa, as well as over 600 prisons across the world. Today, he is watched by over 35 million households daily in India and has received the keys to 22 cities internationally and numerous awards for peace. Not in our lifetime has there been more need for the message of peace and healing in the world. After 50 years to complete the circle, it is time to welcome Prem Rawat back to Glastonbury, to have him bring forth again his message of hope and peace to humanity. Glastonbury Festival is now one of, if not the, greatest musical event in the world, with over 200,000 people attending each year and a billion TV audience courtesy of the BBC. But the festival was, like the Abbey before it, more humble in its beginnings. And we are fortunate enough today to have a number of people here who attended Glastonbury Festival in 1971 and who saw the young Prem Rawat speak. So we are now going to ask for a few of their recollections and the impact that the festival has had on their lives. So first I would like to invite author and senior professor Ron Jeeves to speak. I remember a lot of will he, won't he, should he, shouldn't he, as the possibility of speaking at Glastonbury Fair became a real prospect. You had arrived in London on June 17th, 1971, and as mentioned, you were only 13. Glastonbury was not on your schedule of events. There were those who spoke of drugs, sex, chaos, and advised definitely against going. Others told of prophecies, the spiritual significance of the place and the time, urging you to go. You remain free from all that speculation. Your only concern was would people listen to you? In the meantime, the pleading phone calls from Glastonbury increased. On the morning of the 21st of June, you asked me if a car was available. Yes, I said. Carol's Cortina is here. In the afternoon, you were ready to go. Where to, I asked. Glastonbury, you replied. I remember rain, skidding, people pushing the car up the hill to the pyramid stage. It was all chaos. Then you were on the stage, speaking to the crowd. I stood next to you and looked over the expectant, hushed audience. You kept it short, concise, and then we were leaving. On the way back, we stopped for a tea. You said, be ready. Hundreds will come after this event, and they did. In my memories, Glastonbury Fair, June the 21st, 1971, will always be a significant milestone on a lifetime that you have committed to peace. Thank you very much. I would now like to ask business development consultant Lynn Trine to speak. Thank you.
Well, hello, everyone. I was very happy listening to Ron Jeeves. I was not in the same position as he was in 1971. I was a student at the Bournemouth College of Art and Design. I had come over from America to England to study for a year abroad, and I was in my very final week before I had to fly home. In fact, my last few days. And it was then that a friend of mine from college invited me to go with him and attend this big festival in Glastonbury that I had heard nothing about, but it intrigued me and I accepted. So it had been for me prior to that a very year of introspection, of seeking some kind of inner peace within me, and I had not found that. I don't really know what I was expecting at Glastonbury, <laughs> but when I arrived, what I found that I suddenly was moving through kind of this sea of chaos of concepts, of questions with no apparent answers, uh, confusion of ideas. But also, besides that, as I mingled around all day, there was hopefulness, and that there was hopefulness, and some positivity. But by evening, I had ma made my way to the front of the stage, when Prem Rawat, you know, then a 13-year-old boy, arrived and began speaking. And he spoke with such a clarity, with such, such certainty, that he immediately had my attention. And I don't remember the words exactly that he spoke, but I know that he said that we all have a wisdom, a place of peace within, and that he could help show us how to access that. I was immediately determined to take him up on it. But however, I had to fly home, and months went by before I saw my opportunity to do so, and I was not disappointed. So I am very happy to be here all these years later, here in Glastonbury, that I can stand here and thank you, Prem Rawat, for being here that night. And thank you, Glastonbury, for having him. So thank you. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to ask Renewable Energy Specialist Paul Parker to come and speak, please. Good evening. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, everyone, for, for the invite. While I was writing this the other day, I was reflecting that it's exactly 51 years ago, as a 16-year-old aspiring hippie, I was in a cafe in my hometown of Canterbury discussing travelling to the upcoming Glastonbury Festival in June of 1971. There was a real buzz about the event, not just for the music, but the feeling that there was something special happening. The festival was to be held in the Field of Dragons with a pyramid-shaped stage on a ley line that connected Canterbury, Glastonbury and the Great Pyramid, along with something else about an alignment of the planets. We had to go. So after some bargaining with my dad to get his permission, my best friend and I set off the next day. On arriving at this magical place, I was given a leaflet stating that a 13-year-old boy had travelled from India to speak about peace at the festival that evening. And that is where I first saw and heard Prem Rawat as a young boy. Coming down the hill towards the stage, I saw him lit up on the stage, saying something that stopped me in my tracks. There is something inside you which will never perish. I can reveal it. 
That is what set me on my journey of inner discovery. Some months later in London, I listened to more of Prem's teachings and learned how to find a treasure within. To this day, at the age of 67, amidst all the ups and downs, joys and sorrows, successes and failures, this gift has always been a constant and has is your message, Prem. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. So I would now like to ask celebrity fashion stylist George Bloodwell, who has worked with many Hollywood music and music stars over the years, including Sir Elton John, Celine Dion, Jennifer Hudson, Annie Lennox, Leonard Cohen, and Diana Ross, to name but a few, to come and share his reflections. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I'm a little choked up because uh, <clears throat> here I am in Glastonbury after 50 years. It's amazing. I've got all these crazy, fabulous people in the streets, bohemians, just the same. Anyway, it was 1971 and I heard about Glastonbury. I grew up in the north of England with a Scottish mother and an English father who was actually a prisoner of war in Japan. And he really suffered. And I was horrified at that that people could kill each other and fight. It was awful. So 71's around, and I hear this uh, song by Melanie, who came to Glastonbury. There's a chance. <clears throat> Peace will come. I didn't mean to get so choked out, but it's just being all these lovely feelings. Anyway, Melanie was going to come to Glastonbury. She was going to sing this song, There's a Chance, Peace Will Come. I was obsessed with this song. I would play it 20 times a day. So I came to Glastonbury. And um, I remember arriving and seeing this pyramid stage being built, hearing all these stories about being on the same ley line as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. And uh, I have a bit of a call, so excuse me. And um, I saw the stage being built, and I remember walking away and looking down at everyone, looking at the stage. And I just realized then that it's not just me that's looking. Everybody seemed to be searching. Everybody's looking at the stage. We're all looking for something. Anyway, later on, I, uh, I heard Melanie sing, and it was just, for me, the best. It was beautiful. I went to my tent one night, and uh, snuggling up to my girlfriend, and I hear this little voice. Not, I couldn't remember much, but I can help you all. I can help humanity. And it was Prem. And uh, so Glastonbury made me want to leave home and and search, and I did. And on my way to the Holy Land, I read a, excerpt, a speech that you gave when you were 12 years old. Blew me away. I went, who is this boy? I've got to find him. And I did. And um, then I moved to California, and then I got to know Arabella Churchill, very good friend of mine at this point. And we would take long walks and chat, talk about Andy Kerr, I'm sure some of you know Andy. He was one of the founders of the Glastonbury Fest. Great character. And Arabella was such a character too. She looked like Randolph Churchill. She had these big blue eyes. We would go for walks and chalk, and I would mention Raiji. And um, we talked about Andy, how much we loved him. She was so happy about um, uh, Children's World that she started in Glastonbury. And I understand it's still going on, and grown incredibly, she would be so proud. And I know her daughter, Jessica, who uh, came to visit me too. I think she's running it now. Jessica, your mom would be so proud. She loved children. She loved children's world. She loved Glastonbury. And, uh, well, that was fantastic. I'm trying to think what else I want to say. Um, anyway, Glastonbury sent, uh, cemented my quest all these beautiful people, they were looking just like me, but I, I was going to find it. And I heard Raiji, I heard Prem. And since that day, you brought me so much joy, happiness. You revealed to me the unchanging inside. And uh, I could never thank you enough. Uh, I think that's about it, really. Uh, that's it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
So uh, seamless as this may seem, um, <laughs> Arabella Churchill, of course, was the granddaughter of Winston Churchill, who we mentioned in regard to the silent minute that we observed earlier, something that came from Glastonbury. And the Churchills had quite a large connection with this place. And Arabella, as was just said, was part of the team that put on the 1971 festival. And Jess, Arabella's daughter, was going to be here today, but she had to be called away to a little pop festival that's happening just down the road, <laughs> um, because she is helping to run the whole children's area there. But uh, this morning, she knocked on my door and she said, I have a gift that I would like you to give to Prem. On behalf of my mother, it's called Bella's Field, and it's signed by the author and by Arabella's husband and Jess herself. So, Prem, I'd like to give this to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and there is there's one other person I would like to ask to speak, uh, the final speaker about this festival, perhaps, a man who had a pyramid stage-eyed view of the festival itself, our honoured guest, Prem Rawat. Thank you. Your Worship, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is in many ways uh, a journey back for me too because this morning I would have arrived from India. And there was so much uncertainty. And I had actually left the night before that I didn't even know if there was going to be a place somewhere where I could change. So I actually had two sets of clothes on. <laughs> on the outside, I had a suit and tie and underneath it, I had my Indian clothes on, kurta, pajama, so on. And uh, I was happy when I found the bathroom because at least I could take off what was on the outside and I arrived with the Indian clothes. There was an uncertainty, what's going to happen? There was an uncertainty, would anybody even give me the time of day to listen to what I have to say? because you can't just take it for granted. It's a different world. Leaving India, for me, was very different because this is where I was raised, this is where I went to school. I knew the culture, I knew, I mean, I knew everything. And then all of a sudden, I was going to a world where I knew nothing. And I came and it was a shock. I turned on the TV, and I mean, you could have lifted my chin from the ground and put it up because it was in color. I had never seen color TV before, only black and white. And I could not understand how did they pull that off. <laughs> and from there, everything began. People would come, and I focused on what they wanted me to tell them. Because I needed to tell them what I needed to tell them. There was a lot of ideas that people had. Even today, there's a lot of ideas that people have. I go around the world, and I mention the word peace. And immediately, people spring to it as though they are the experts at peace. And they know everything about peace, of which they don't have any, even a small pin drop of it. The only time they have experienced it when they put on their earplugs. But you will not find a mention of earplugs in any scripture or any prophet saying, oh yeah, we all need earplugs and then we will have peace. 
Because peace isn't just absence of noise. Peace isn't when every little child has a smile on their face. Maybe they choose not to smile that day. Children can be quite honorary. I know I have grandchildren, I have children of my own, and they may decide not to smile that day. Just be serious, what are you gonna do? But there is peace. And that peace is not something that we will find by searching for it. But that peace is inside of us. Each human being, regardless of who they are, how low, how high, how successful, how unsuccessful they are in this world, if they are alive, they have peace inside of them. Just not that long ago, I was in Zimbabwe. And particularly, I had been invited by the Commissioner General of the prisons to come and address the inmates who had been going through the peace education program. It was, it was chaotic, to say the least, because everything kept changing. The venues kept changing, and the venue that we were going to be at, all of a sudden, in that particular um, prison, uh, COVID broke out, so we couldn't be there, and so where are we going to be? Anyways, it happened. It was a room, and it was packed with inmates. Now, if you're an inmate, there really isn't too much to celebrate. I mean, one, there you are. You have been segregated. You, you are not deemed worthy to be part of society. You have to be segregated. So they are segregated. Future doesn't look good. Future doesn't look bright. They're wearing uniforms, orange, so they can be picked out a mile away, like a flashing beacon, in case, just in case, they decided to escape. And yet, they had a smile on their face, and a big one at that. And what was that all about? In the face of utter darkness, you know, when hope is removed from a person's life, things become very dark. And things become so dark that you cannot make sense of what is happening. You cannot make sense of life. You cannot make sense of what will happen. And yet, in that moment, there is a light shining bright in the heart of every single human being. This light, those inmates felt. Yes, the dark, nobody removed the darkness. They were still in prison. <laughs> but they saw the light. They saw the light in their heart. They saw the light, the light that beckons them to come forward and join the realm of something that is so exquisite, the realm of peace. What is so special about Glastonbury, what makes it a special place? I mean, you could say, is it because of all these things that happened? Is that why it's special? Or because it was special, all these things happened? But whatever happened, it has touched people's lives. And so far it does. 
and it continues to. Then that light continues to shine bright. And people will find that hope, that peace in their lives without changing anything. That's the beauty of it. When you can see the light, you don't have to change your eyes. If, it's, if you've been traveling in a dark, dark ocean, and all of a sudden there is a, there is a lighthouse, you don't have to change your eyes. You don't have to change the ship. You don't have to join a different ocean. All you have to do is open your eyes and look, and you will see. Those eyes, my friends, that are capable of seeing darkness are also capable of seeing light. The same human being that is capable of experiencing turmoil is also capable of experiencing peace. It's no different. We look at the sun. And especially in England, we like the warmth of the sun. But do you know, it feels so good to be in the sun, and yet that sun can destroy you? That can kill you? It's called sun poisoning. You get too much sun, and next thing you know, you're in the hospital fighting for your life. Water. Water, 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 water is so wonderful. And it has the power to give life, but it also has the power to remove life. It's not just one way. It's not just one way. We just heard music and it was incredible. That instrument, the violin, nicely, beautifully played. The guitar, beautifully played. And it sounded good. In, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but including the harkness and including the instruments can also make very obnoxious music. The capacity is there, but the capacity is also there to make exquisite music, which they did. That's a human being. That's a human being. Irrespective of what they believe in, what they know, what they don't know, there is the possibility. 51 years ago that I came, stood on that, or sat down on that pyramid state. This is the message I wanted, that there is something inside of you. And in fact, I have a poster in my office that has that exact quote. There is something inside of you that will never perish. And I can show you that. Glass so, in a way, is the history repeating itself? Yes and no. Because a moment gone is a moment gone and is gone forever. But another moment comes. And it presents something incredible. When I came, here, all those years ago, I never thought I'd be in this hall, talking graciously, the mayor welcoming me. I didn't think this was ever going to happen. But it is happening. It's not the Glastonbury stage. It's another kind of stage. People are listening to this message that we are talking about this evening. And who knows? And this has always been my prayer. Who knows? Somebody will hear this message and their lives will be transformed. Because this is how it happens. This is how it happens. You never know which day is your lucky day. It's always there, but it could be that one day that could be your lucky day. That it makes sense, that something clicks, that something 
you understood that this life is not a series of questions with no answers. But in fact, there are more answers than there are questions. And the way you figure it out, the day you figure that out, my friend, that is your lucky day. So I don't know, I came on that stage. I, there was a lot of ifs for me, you know, and uh, yeah, Carol was there. We were driving around. All I just remember was like, you know, how far away are we? She goes, oh, not too far away. I said, well, let's go there. So we went. Arrived. Nobody was ready for it. Nobody was ready for it. I said what I said. Somebody unplugged my microphone. They were, because they were playing music and then everything was brought to a halt and a chair was put out for me and so on. And maybe they were jealous. <laughs> but I got my few words in. To this day, I'm pursuing the same thing. Every day, the only difference is, the only difference is that uncertainty that I came with when I left India is now all but gone. Because now I am sure that every human being can benefit from the message of peace. So, uh, in a way, it's, it's my lucky day. <laughs> uh, and whoever can hear that message, it is their lucky day. I thank Honorable Mayor. I thank all of you for coming and for giving me this time. Uh, and I hope that enjoy, enjoy the idea of that light on the horizon and fulfill your life. Thank you. gentlemen, it is time for us to witness the inaugural ceremony of the King of Avalon. And I call upon the Worshipful Mayor of Glastonbury to make the presentation. Thank you very much. So, inspired by the ancient custom of gifting keys to the city to a trusted friend of the community, Glastonbury Town Council has created a new civic honour, the Key of Avalon. There is no better person, in my opinion, to be the first recipient of the Key of Avalon than Prem Rao. <laughs> Prem, as I'm sure you know, is a global peace ambassador whose work advances dignity, peace, and prosperity, helping address the fundamental human needs of water and food in many places, who has traveled the world with a simple yet practical message, peace is possible. It is my pleasure and my privilege to present this key to you, Prem, the key of Avalon. And I hope that you will return to Glastonbury as our trusted friend. Thank you so much. So um, now we are going to uh, move from this very warm room to a, another perhaps hopefully cooler room where I would invite you to have some refreshments with us whilst um, we take the opportunity of having some photos of Prem with the Key. But thank you so much for coming and I hope that uh, 
you'll be able to find your way downstairs. I'm sure that somebody will be able to lead the way. And uh, we will have uh, Jenny play some music as we leave the room. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Prem. Thank you, Thank you everyone.